Uh, so you're not coming. Hello and welcome to the Kaleva seminar for Michaelmas term. My name is Rob Gilbert and I'm serving um, as director of the Kaleva Center for Evolution and Human Science here at Magdalen. You're all very welcome and it's a special pleasure to welcome Tim Barraclough who's going to give our seminar today. Tim is a, an awardee of one of a new round of, of grants that the Kaleva Center is going to be making this term and then in, in subsequent terms to support re research in the broad interdisciplinary areas that we that we cover. So over to you, Tim. And at the end, there'll be a chance for questions, as well as people here in the auditorium. We've got quite a few people joining us online, and we'll also be allowing them to ask questions as well. And I should be monitoring the chat for that. So thank you, Tim, very much for giving our seminar this term. Thank you much. Um, and thank you to the uh, Kaleva Center for um, funding this project. I should say at the start that the project hasn't begun yet. It will start in um, maybe at the start of next year. So I'm gonna be telling you a bit about the background and the motivation for what we're interested in, in doing um, and, and the plans rather than giving you um, any concrete outcomes at this stage. Um, so the, the call for uh, projects that we applied to was called Threats to Humanity, Challenges and Opportunities. Um, sounds a bit of a scary title, but I'm going to use it to um, go through and explain the background to why we're interested in this um, uh, particular project. So in terms of the threats that this project is going to investigate, we're interested in crop disease, uh, pests and disease. In terms of the challenges, why those are hard to manage, we're going to think about uh, evolution and how evolutionary responses of, of disease make it difficult for us to control uh, crop diseases. And in terms of opportunities, we're going to think about how we can use understanding of evolution and combine that with new genetic tools um, to try and come up with um, better methods that hopefully can help um, in this um, fight against crop disease. So to start with the threats then, um, so over 20% of global crop production is lost to uh, pests and disease each year. This is from a, a paper that quantified it in 2019 for the five uh, major crops. Uh, you will see higher numbers quoted sometimes. It depends a little bit whether you include um, pests that sort of attack stored food as well as those that are attacking um, crops in the ground. And uh, so clearly this is um, not a good thing and there's various ways that this pre presents a threat uh, to humanity. So the first of course is, is food security. And I'm just showing a couple of examples here from um, uh, very large and horrific events in the past um, where crop diseases have been associated with uh, major loss of life. Um, so the first of them on the, on the left here, I would imagine a lot of the people in the room have heard of. This was the um, Irish potato famine um, in 1845 to 1849, um, where the introduction and spread of a fungus-like organism called Phytophthora infestans that caused potato late blight uh, led to over 80% loss of yield in the potato crop. Um, and for various other compounding reasons that included reliance on a single uh, food source, um, uh, weather patterns in those years, um, and also um, uh, kind of mismanagement of the situation and, and the real failure of British colonial rule there, um, then this led to an estimated one million deaths and over a million people who emigrated. And the, and the kind of legacies of this event are still present in, 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 in Ireland and beyond around the rest of the world as a result of these major changes and horrible loss of life. Um, the one on the right here, I don't know if that is as as, as familiar to people. Has anyone heard of the Great Bengal Famine in the audience here? There's one person who I'm pleased has heard. Um, and this um, was 100 years later, 1943. Um, and there was a, uh, an epidemic of this, um, this fungus that caused brown spot of rice that led to between 40 to 90% loss of production of rice crop um, depending on the exact variety. 
Now, this was compounded by lots of reasons. And if you read about this, and I would recommend that everybody does so, because I hadn't, I, I didn't, I wasn't really familiar with this until I started looking. Uh, so obviously this was at a time of war, um, but sadly was also associated with mismanagement through uh, British colonial rule. Uh, and there was a, a massive and tragic loss of life that was compounded by all of these things. Um, but the immediate reduction in the, in the uh, yield of the rice was associated with um, this disease. Um, so cle clearly there were these huge uh, threats to uh, human life and well-being from crop diseases. Of course, there's a threat to the economy as well. Uh, so it's been estimated that the costs of crop pests and disease uh, per year um, are in the order of 220 billion uh, US dollars. Here's just a couple of more uh, current examples. Um, this is actually showing the outcome of Panama disease on, on bananas, but there's other diseases affecting bananas. This is a, a coffee pathogen. And, and um, both of these organisms here can cause yield losses of 50% or more that compound over time, and your whole farms and economies are lost. Um, and this was from a new story about 400,000 coffee workers losing their jobs as a result of this disease here. Uh, bananas are also a food source for subsistence farmers, so this kind of overlaps with the, the risks here. Uh, oops, sorry, I should press this. Um, and then there are also threats to the environment. So um, there's uh, the Living Planet Index and other um, approaches that are used to try and monitor biodiversity in the wild have shown that um, wildlife populations uh, have declined in abundance on average about 70% since 1970, and land use change is consistently seen as the main driver for that, a lot of which is associated with agriculture. Then, of course, there are other effects to do with pesticides, fertilizers, and so on. So if we could reduce the losses to pests, then potentially we could use less land area to uh, grow food. Um, and so all of these things are pressure on our ability to produce food and the knock-on effects on the environment that come from that. So how do we uh, control crop pests and disease? Um, there's several approaches, of course. Um, one is developing new resistant crop varieties. Um, so either by traditional plant breeding, or that could be through GM methods to introduce uh, resistance genes into crops. Um, and this can be very successful. Uh, so this picture here is just showing a, a cotton farm where they planted um, a, a previous sort of strain that is uh, susceptible to this particular uh, pest here. I think it was an insect infestation and this other one that was a GM uh, crop. Uh, so obviously that can, that can be successful. Um, then there's pesticides of various kinds um, and also methods that would come under sort of uh, crop sanitation, so uh, maintaining good hygiene, rotating, or growing mixed crops together. Oops, I keep pressing that. So without these current measures, um, it's been estimated, these are the bars now for the same plot that I showed earlier, but with what the losses would be if we didn't deploy these current plant protection products um, that we have in our, in our sort of arsenal, and we would be maybe looking at 50% um, loss. And this is quite challenging because there's recognition that may, uh, many of, or some of these, for especially pesticides, then they have knock-on effects in the environment. They may be um, affecting other organisms that aren't the pests that we're trying to control. Uh, and so, for example, uh, the European Commission had this uh, new sort of policy thing, Green Deal, where they, they're wanting to reduce chemical uh, inputs by a certain amount in agriculture. And the question is, what are we going to replace those with? Because if we do that and don't replace them with anything else, then we're going to increase the amount of the crop that is lost. Okay. So that's a kind of overview of the, of the background and why this represents a threat to humanity. Now, in terms of this, the, the phrasing of the, of the call by the Kaleva Center, um, what are the challenges? So why is it that we, we, we lose so much and it's so hard to, to control these, um, these uh, diseases? 
and to think about that, we can think about how um, hosts and their pathogens, so that would, in, uh, so pest diseases, things that attack them, uh, how do they evolve in the wild? Um, and a general uh, kind of concept for this is thinking about coevolution. So if you have a host and a pathogen that attacks it, so there's a fungus here that's growing on this plant, um, then the fungus has traits that allow it to infect the plant and the plant has traits that might allow it to resist the fungus. And so there's a continual coevolution and selection that the plant should try and increase its um, uh, resistance to the fungus and the fungus should evolve new ways to overcome the resistance and become virulent again on the plant. And this reciprocal um, selection between the, the partners leads to um, an arms race and or can lead to an arms race and escalation over time. So the fungus becomes more and more, um, gets nastier and nastier traits for attacking the plant. The plant gets more and more defenses. Um, and there's another feature of this that's relevant for thinking about agricultural systems is that common genotypes tend to be targeted, especially by uh, strong selection. So if you imagine now we've got, this is showing the plants over here, host population, and initially it's, it's genetically uniform. So green here is representing a genotype, a particular genetic variant of this plant. And let's suppose that a new pest manages to colonize this plant and starts doing quite well on them. So as a result of this, the frequency of, of, this, of this genotype, or these, these are gonna be affected by the, the pest, it's reducing, um, their survival or, or ability to reproduce. The pest will increase in numbers, the plant would uh, go down in numbers. But then the selection for resistance to the pest in the plant population. So you get a new genotype here that I'm showing in yellow that is actually resistant to these, these, uh, this particular type of pest. And so that genotype now is gonna spread in the population as the other genotype uh, declines. So now you end up with a plant population where it's mainly the yellow genotype, but now there's selection on the pest population um, to adapt to this new resistant genotype and come up with new ways to overcome its defenses. Um, and so now there's a purple pest and that starts increasing in abundance and the previous version of the pest decreases. And so this can lead to these um, cycles, uh, co-evolutionary cycles between different um, genetic variants of the host and the pest. So these are the general features of how hosts and pathogens uh, evolve and adapt to each other in, in when we're thinking sort of about wild species. There could be arms race and escalation. There's this tendency for the common genotype to be targeted that could lead to these co-evolutionary cycles. And as a result of this, then pathogens are under selection to be fast and furious, that they should be able to evolve and adapt and, and generate variability as quickly as they can. And similarly, the immune systems of hosts are under similar selection to be able to generate variability as quickly as they can to keep up in this um, co-evolution and arms race. Okay, so that's sort of background of what we might expect in, in wild species and agriculture can be seen as having intensified some of these natural processes. Um, so this is just to put some context on this. Um, so there's about 600 million hectares of uh, tropical rainforest remaining uh, in the world. Within that, there's about 40,000 plant species. An almost equivalent area of land now is occupied by just three. Uh, species, maize, rice, and wheat, so these main uh, staples. So clearly this is a huge change, and it's a huge opportunity for, for pathogens, pests, to adapt to these particular three species and take advantage of these large expanses of the same species. And not only that, often uh, very reduced uh, genetic diversity because there might be a single cultivar that's being used because of beneficial properties for that. Another sort of staggering statistic here that, that also puts this in, in context is that humans have been estimated to take about a quarter of the net plant productivity, so plant growth uh, converted from sunshine uh, around the world uh, each year. 
Um, and so there's a huge amount of energy and opportunity for these pests and diseases that has been shuttled into these relatively few species that we use as our main staples. So it's unsurprising then that there's a lot of um, that a lot of pests shift onto those, they adapt to those. Um, and then what you see is the um, agricultural equivalent of these co-evolutionary cycles. You can get boom bust uh, cycles. So I'll talk you through what this is uh, showing here. Um, this is from a, a, a data that are showing for oat crops in Iowa. And the solid lines are showing two successive, uh, where is this other solid line? I think there's a solid line that's not showing up on the graph here. Okay, yeah, it's not solid lines, it's this one. So there's, this is a particular variety of oats that was resistant to the main pest around at the time. And so it spread to be the most proportion of, of type of oat that was being planted. But as soon as that was used uh, quite commonly, then you had associated uh, crown rust fungi uh, genotypes that were adapting to that uh, resistant variety. And as a result of that, it became a use, you know, they couldn't use it anymore. It was becoming infected too much. And so they replaced it. It's actually this line. It's not another solid line. Um, so this is a, an alter, a new resistant variety, and sure enough, when that is becoming more commonly used, um, then the the pathogens that are adapted to that variety start to spread. So you are intensifying these co-evolutionary cycles between um, crop genotypes and the pathogen. So that means you can never just have a resistant genotype of your crop. You're always needing to come up with new ones as the uh, as the pests, the fungus in this case, evolved to overcome those previous uh, defenses. Uh, what makes it even worse is that, of course, there's lots of potential diseases out there. And even if you manage to control one of them, uh, then a new one will take its place. Um, so this was a study in the Canadian prairies. They're here uh, where they were growing wheat. And this is just showing the different, um, these are all fungi again, but the different diseases that were prevalent at different periods through time here. And so there was a thing called common bunt. At some point, they got a, a grip of that, and it no longer was a, a major pathogen. But about that time, leaf rust became more important. That was replaced by tan spot and so on. So as soon as you control one, a new one will take its uh, place. Uh, it's even worse than that, um, that these different uh, fungal uh, diseases can actually interact with each other and swap genes. So this tan spot one that became a problem here actually acquired one of its nasty genes that allow it to attack uh, wheat crops from a, a different unrelated fungus. So there was a transfer of quite a large chunk of DNA that brought with it toxin genes that allowed it to infect the wheat. Uh, so that's looking at how uh, disease evolves against uh, resistant crops. Um, but of course, the other method of control is spraying. And there's a similar story there. So fungicide resistance for most classes of fungicides. So these are just different classes of fungicides here. For these four classes here, um, what I'm showing is the blue is sort of when they were first developed and released and used in the market. And the red is when the first uh, resistant uh, fungi fungi that could resist those new fungicides were detected in, in the field. And so within about uh, 10 years or so, uh, resistance to fungicides evolves. Any new class of fungicides, and then they need to be kind of replaced by a new class of fungicides. Uh, this is a very similar picture to you would see if you looked at a plot of uh, new antibiotics, classes of antibiotics being produced. And in that case, within about five years, there tend to be the first resistance bacteria appearing um, that can uh, cope with them. Okay, so that's a sort of overview of why evolution causes a problem, that we can never stand still. There's, the pests are evolving constantly, they're overcoming our, our control measures, and so we're always having to adapt them to cope with the new pests that are coming uh, along the horizon. So by way of uh, background then, what about 
the opportunities. And I'm going to... Uh, so there are opportunities that come from thinking about how this evolution is playing out, um, but especially if we try and combine those with some new genetic tools that have become available over the last few years. And so now, it's my final part of sort of background to the project, I'll explain what those are about. So first of all, this is a bit more uh, sort of information about our current, uh, or one of the main current methods, which is uh, the use of fungicides. So how do fungicides actually work and how were they developed? And there's these two main types of fungicides that have been used that we can contrast. So one of them is called multi-site uh, fungicides. And they're called that because they're a chemical that actually targets lots of different parts of cellular metabolism in the uh, fungus. Uh, so this is just, I put this up in case there are any chemists in the uh, audience, uh, but this is one of them, it's called Mancozeb. And this um, inactivates sulfhydryl groups of, of proteins, so particularly of enzymes, and it affects lots of different uh, cellular processes. So the benefit of that is that it's relatively hard for the organism to evolve resistance to this because it would require lots of genetic changes. The disadvantage, and it's a big disadvantage, is it's much more likely to be toxic to everything else as well. Um, and in fact, a lot of these are now being withdrawn from use. So I think even Mancozeb possibly is being withdrawn from the market this year because of these potential off-site effects. So in humans, it affects thyroid activity and potentially is carcinogenic and so on. So the alternative type of fungicide that's been developed is these single site ones. Um, and so these are ones that uh, instead of affecting lots of different uh, bits and pieces within the cell, they affect a single enzyme or structural site. And so the advantage of that is that they can be much more specific. So a lot of them, for example, have been designed to target a particular um, pathway that produces a particular chemical that's found in fungal cell membranes, but not in other, not in plants or animals. Um, so there's an example of one of those here, um, this azole. Uh, so ergosterol is a compound that's in, in um, fungal cell membranes. And this enzyme, this, com this fungicide interacts with a single enzyme that is involved in the production of ergosterol. Uh, I put this up Rob, here, here's a structural thing showing. So this is the, this is the fungicide. Um, this is the enzyme that's being affected. And the, and the key disadvantage with this type of fungicide is it's very easy to evolve resistance. And so actually the blobs here are showing where resistant mutations can occur that mean that the chemical is no longer active and, and the um, fungus can actually produce its cell membranes fine. Okay. But the reason for sort of giving that background is, is contrasting these different aspects of uh, specificity. So ideally you would want something that's specific. So you're not having lots of off-target effects that are toxic for animals or um, other fungi in the environment, but just target your, uh, your pathogen. But equally, you don't want to use things where they're going to be evolve, able to evolve resistance very easily. So this is where the new uh, sort of tools might come in. So we're in the middle of a, a genomic revolution where our, our, the, our ability to do all sorts of things has just been transformed, transformed over the last few years. So one part of this is just the amount of genome sequenced uh, information that we have for large numbers of different species now. Uh, so that's extremely useful. This is just a graph showing the number of species where there's a whole whole genome sequence available over time. You can see it's just shooting up towards the present here. But the second part of it is our ability to um, manipulate uh, genomes and try and use this information to control uh, populations. And there's a few different approaches out there that I'm, I'm sure a lot of you have heard of. Uh, so one of them is gene editing. So for example, using uh, CRISPR-Cas9, which is actually a system that bacteria use to try and defend themselves against um, their pests or, or uh, bacteriophage viruses. Um, but this is um, an approach that allows you to very precisely edit um, bits of the genome. Uh, and so this is extremely exciting and, and powerful for making changes. 
Um, then there's approaches like uh, gene tribe, where we can use selfish genes to try and drive um, uh, desirable or uh, useful traits for controlling a population through that population. Um, so one example of that is with uh, mosquito vectors of malaria. There's a project um, that Charles is involved in and uh, it's led through Imperial College that is developing systems like that that could be used to try and control uh, Anopheles gambii that causes uh, malaria in, um, in Africa. So this is a way of changing the genetics of a, of a focal population in the wild. Um, and the final one I'm going to explain a bit more is uh, RNA inter interference, RNAi. Oops, is that not working now? Uh -huh. Okay, so how might we use these in the context of crop diseases? Um, so with the CRISPR-Cas, we might edit the plant genome to add in resistance genes and be able to do that much faster than we could by traditional plant breeding methods. Uh, we might also be able to edit the pathogen genome, uh, which might help us in discovering exactly which genes in the pathogen are the ones causing the, causing the problem and allowing it to affect the plant. So it's a very useful research tool for that. In terms of gene drive, we might try to spread uh, genes through the pathogen that um, either reduce its ability to affect, infect the plant or, or suppress its, its population in other ways. Um, in fungi, that, there's some genes called spore killers that you might be able to use to do that. Um, and with the RNAi method, you might be able to spray uh, plants with, um, with RNAs that can be used to inhibit um, gene expression. And I'll explain this one a bit more because this is the approach that we're going to try and, and look at in the, in the funded project. Uh, so how does RNAi, uh, RNA interference work? Um, biology is very complicated and um, I tried looking for figures of this and they're all hideously complicated because of the number of proteins that are involved. So I tried to distill it down to the, to the, more to the basics. Um, so this is a gene here and when a gene is expressed uh, in a process called uh, transcription, then you, it, you make messenger RNA that kind of takes the information from the gene, it moves through the cell, it joins up with a ribosome and the ribosome uses this to build a, a protein and your gene is expressed, okay? That's what normally happens. So this could be a gene, that, a protein then that is gonna be used by the fungus to infect the plant. Um, so how RNA interference works is that you add some uh, double-stranded RNA. This, through a very complicated route, this gets processed, taken into the cell and processed and produces a short interfering RNA that is designed to match a little bit of this particular gene that you're wanting to um, affect here. And it causes the mRNA to be chopped up and chucked in the cellular bin. And so the, what that means is that you're able to down-regulate that gene or, or, or stop the, um, the cell from producing that gene. So this, if this is a protein that is involved in a pest being able to infect a crop plant, and if you could spray RNA and it would actually take it up in this way, um, then you could reduce its ability to infect the crop. Um, so here are some examples of where this has been tried out in fungal uh, pathogens. So you can see this, and this is only part of the table that fitted on here. This is from this paper. It's quite interesting. If anyone's interested in um, finding out more about this as an approach, um, but there's a few Key advantages for it, I mean, one is thinking about the fungicide approach. This is highly specific. So these small bit, small RNAs that are used here are 21 base sequences. Um, so there's like 4.4 trillion different possible sequences there. And it's only if that matches with your messenger RNA that it will have an effect. So you can really look carefully and there should be a lot less, a lot fewer problems of, of off-target effects because it's a very specific system. Um, a key advantage, this isn't genetic uh, modification, it's classed as a chemical. So there's, there's very little regulatory um, issue with working with these. You can use them in the lab, you can spray them in the field. Um, it's a molecule, it's a molecule that doesn't have a particularly long 
uh, life out in, in the environment anyway, um, but also it's, it should only be having these very specific effects. Okay. But for all of these new genetic um, methods that are very exciting, the question still remains, which gene or set of genes in either the plant or the fungus or rubber pests should we actually um, try and target? Um, so, you know, this shows a genome. This is actually the pineapple genome that uh, my colleague Andrew was involved in the publication of this. So this is the chromosomes of the pineapple genome. And this, this kind of uh, furball here is showing a regulatory network of all of the genes in, in, in the pineapple. So there's tens of thousands of, uh, in the leaf, there's tens of thousands of genes we could target. Which ones are we going to choose? And then this might be a pathogen genome over here. Again, tens of thousands of genes. How do we choose which ones we're going to use um, with these methods available to us now? So that's, that's the background to the project. And that's the, the sort of thing we're wanting to, to start out and get, get into with this, um, is how do we choose which genes we could target and, and design better approaches for um, controlling crop diseases in future. And the sort of thesis of the, of the project is that by understanding how crop pathogens adapted to control measures in the past, this should be useful information in helping to design control measures in the future. Even if we're using slightly different approaches, it's still useful to know what is the typical pattern of evolution of different types of genes in, um, in, the, in these problem uh, populations, these um, crop diseases. Okay. So I'm going to give a couple of examples of where we've been uh, using this approach of trying to look into the past. And then at the end, um, I will come back and show how we're going to develop that now through the uh, Kaleva project. So first of all, this is a, a study that looked at um, using this approach of looking into the past, which we called historical genomics. We're looking at a particular disease of coffee called coffee wilt disease. Um, and this was a project that Lily Peck has been working on as a PhD project. She's nearly, she's writing and submitting, writing up and submitting next week, I think. Um, and she's, uh, I was previously at Imperial College London. She's finishing off there. So this is work that she's been doing at Imperial College London. It was funded by um, the Natural Environment Research Council. So this is a coffee bush that's been affected by coffee wilt disease. You can see it's sort of wilted and lost all of its leaves there. And this causes a, a quite a large loss in, in crop in this case. So Lily chose to look at this, um, this case because it had quite an interesting history. Um, so this is a disease that's found on coffee, on coffee plantations in Africa. Um, and uh, caused by this particular fungus, Fusarium xylarioides. And there was an original epidemic that lasted from about 1920 to 1960 that was primarily in Central and West Africa and affecting a, a range of different coffee species that were, were being used in those plantations. That epidemic was brought under control um, primarily by sort of crop sanitation methods, so by keeping the fields cleaner and so on. But then around the 1990s, uh, this disease re-emerged and it re-emerged uh, further east and the interesting thing was that now it seemed to comprise two host specialists on different types of coffee. So there's Robusta coffee and Arabica coffee uh, that you may have heard of. These are used as names where your Arabica coffee is supposed to be particularly good I believe although I don't actually drink coffee. Um, so uh, and Arabica coffee is grown in, in more in the highlands in Ethiopia and the Robusta coffee is grown in, in uh, Uganda and other places here. And so there are two types of fungus that were specialized to these um, two different types of coffee. So the question Lily was interested to work out was what happened? How do these later epidemics relate, relate to the earlier one? And can we identify which, what genetic changes um, happened that actually enabled these later um, epidemics. Oops, that's that as well. Um, and the trick and the reason we can go back in time to look at this is that uh, um, comes from um, the collaboration here with an organization called CABI who hold the frozen 
fungal culture collection for the UK. Uh, this is Matthew Ryan, who's the curator, director of the, um, of the collection, who's a co-supervisor of Lily on this project. Um, and they have lots of living fungal isolates that have been frozen at minus 80 degrees that we, Lily was able to get out of the freezer, regrow on plates, and then use this to um, sequence their genomes, but also to uh, measure other aspects of, of, um, of their properties. So initially she picked these six um, isolates that covered the, uh, the original uh, epidemic that was more in Central and West Africa, and then the Robusta and the Arabica. So it's two of each of those uh, categories. So this shows her latest um, genome for one of the Arabica isolates that was actually done with Oxford nanopore technology. Um, that's a technology that can sequence longer strings of DNA. Um, the company is actually based in the modeling um, uh, science park. So indirectly, uh, modeling can claim credit for this plot as well. Um, and so these are showing uh, various almost chromosomes probably here and then some little bits that might be small chromosomes or just pieces that couldn't be kind of assembled with everything else. So what can we find out then from sequencing these genomes? So first of all, how does this relate to the earlier epidemic? Um, so what she found was that the recent uh, uh, specialist on, on the Robusta coffee in, in Uganda and the lowlands does seem to originate from the original epidemic um, back in the 20s and so on, um, and 50s that was in West Africa. Um, but the organism that's causing the same disease symptoms on the Arabica coffee seems to be something more divergent and that may even have diverged a long time ago on wild coffee species, even before uh, humans were cultivating them. Um, so possibly a separate wild origin. <coughs> But then the key thing of interest is what are the actual genetic differences that might be behind the specialism on the different hosts and changes in how pathogenic they are on these different plants. And so she searched through the genome for what we would call putative effector genes. So these are genes that might produce proteins that function in, in infecting the plant and allowing the fungus to grow on the plant. Um, so the fungus, the wilt disease actually colonizes uh, the xylem and in the xylem there's not much um, nutrient, there's not many nutrients available and so it actually has enzymes to break down the cell walls and therefore infect the plant. So you can look for these types of genes in these different genomes. So what's shown here is each row here is a different uh, gene. And these are all of the putative effector genes that she found in the, in the genomes. The different colors are slightly different criteria for determining what might be an effector gene. Uh, that's not so important um, for today. But the key thing uh, to point out is that there are some cases, this is showing the two robusta isolates, the, uh, the older ones from the original epidemic and the Arabica. And there are some genes that appear to be only in the robust, uh, only in the Robusta population. There are some that the Robusta shares with the coffee, uh, the, the, the original epidemic. There are some that are only found in the Arabica population. Um, and so it looks like these different uh, fungi have kind of gained effector genes from somewhere, uh, all of them, but by mapping this onto a sort of wider set of, of genomes of different related fungi, we conclude that they appear to be gaining effector genes from somewhere. And so the question then is, where did they come from? And um, surprisingly, um, it looks like uh, some of these genes are being acquired from different, fairly unrelated fungi. They're still within the same genus of Fusarium, but called this species Oxysporum, that infects a wide range of different plants and actually one of these is the, it causes the Panama disease that is um, a big problem in banana plantations. And there's quite a similar match here. Um, so the details here aren't important, but we're able to find in the genome, a large chunk of the genome that shares a very close match with this other species. So it looks like in this case, the Arabica strain of the fungus has acquired a load of, of genes that uh, are, are 
um, associated with infection from these other um, species that might be growing on other crops nearby, other plants nearby the, in the coffee plantations. Um, I'll skip over this, but this is just to show that these frozen fungi that have been at minus 80 for 20 years, uh, they can still infect plants. And she was able to show that these genes are really being switched on when they infect the plants as well. Um, so the summary then from this is the later epidemics gained these effector genes from distantly related species. Um, I think I skipped over that, but um, these, these chunks of DNA that, uh, DNA that have been transferred are particularly associated with um, what are called transposable elements that are, are jumping genes that can actually translocate around genomes and potentially between genomes, like appears to be going on here. Um, and so this provides uh, um, insight then into how have the uh, plants adapted, uh, sorry, the fungi adapted over time in a way that has allowed them to become epidemics then that are specialist on these two different uh, species of coffee. Okay. So that's one example of, of looking into of this approach of looking into the past. Um, and then we've also been trying to expand this to look at other fungal pathogens as well. Um, and this was work that was funded by a John Fell project here in Oxford and Edgar Wong worked as a, um, a postdoc on this for a couple of years. So here we focused in more on UK crop pathogens and, and this kind of time scale that we can look back at using the um, CABI collection of frozen isolates really spans this key period during um, UK or, and well, global agriculture where there was a huge change in, in approaches. Uh, so the yield of this is referring to wheat here, but the yield went up massively as people were developing new varieties of wheat. I've already shown this plot. There's been various classes of fungicide that have been introduced at different periods of time over this period. And this is the percentage of the wheat crop that was actually sprayed with fungicide. Uh, so back in the 1960s, they didn't really spray wheat with fungicides at all. And this spread to 100% within a short period um, in the 1970s and, and 19, to 1980 there. So we're interested in looking back through these samples over time and seeing if we can see what way have they been evolving to these major changes in, in their environment, all of these new chemicals that are being sprayed around um, and changes in uh, crop varieties and so on. So this picture shows um, a list of about 30 different plant pathogens where, and these are the samples that are available in the CABI collection. Um, the black ones are UK isolates, the gray ones are sort of global isolates that provide context for that through this key period from 1950 to the present day. And so you can see there's a very dense kind of sampling overall that could allow us to look for trends that they've been in, in parallel in all of these um, uh, fungi during this, this time. How have they adapted to, for example, the spread of fungicide uh, applications during the middle of this uh, kind of time period. So as pilot work for this, um, Edgar uh, selected five species that uh, we looked at. These are just, these aren't all of the collect collection from CABI, but there are a certain number that we could afford to do within the scale of this project. And you can see that even here, this sparser data set is spanning um, this key 10 year period when uh, fungicide use spread. Uh, and this is what they all do. There are different types of uh, pathogens on fruit, on wheat. Some of them are generalists, some of them are specialists. Uh, sorry. So what kind of things can we do with this? We can look for fung fungicide resistance mutations. So for these single site fungicides, we know which genes uh, are, are, um, evolve and, and acquire resistant mutations. So we can pull out the sequences from our samples and identify within a particular gene that's targeted by one of the fungicides. We can see some changes here in the DNA sequence in some uh, a later sample in this case. Uh, even without knowing which genes to focus on, we can look for those genes that have shown very rapid changes in, in variants that are present over time during this um, time window. So those would be called selective sweeps. It's where all of the isolates at the beginning of the time period have a particular um, 
base, a, a, a part of a, of a gene, and then over time that's swapped by a different one. So, and that would be, if it happens over a short enough time scale, that would be consistent with selection driving a beneficial uh, new variant through the, through the population. So we can try and look for those, and the red lines here are pulling out um, kind of significantly um, large changes in allele frequency um, at some of the genes within, um, within these genomes. And then finally, as in the coffee example, we can look for gain and loss of, of, of genes that are associated with infectivity of these fungi. Um, and so these are some of, some of the genes that might be involved in breaking down plant cells and how the numbers of them have changed through some isolates of this fungus over time. Um, so we've just got some of these genome uh, sequences back. We're kind of working through it at the moment. But the general idea is that through these sorts of analyses, um, then we can pull together a time series of evolution during this period of major agricultural change. And then can we use that information to help work out what sets of genes and types of um, application. So assuming that we can target the geno genome in much more precise detail with these new uh, genetic tools, uh, what types of genes should we be looking at doing and, and can we use that past information to help guide what we would do in the future? Okay, so that is a long, <laughs> very long way to get to explaining what the project itself is actually about, but it follows from uh, what I've just been talking about. So this is a kind of outline of what we're going to do now with the Kaleva project. So the idea is the starting point is we're feeding in these genomic time series of, of pathogen evolution. And in the, in the new project, we will bring in and take advantage of multidisciplinary expertise as well. So initially we'll have a working group where we try and design in the principles of what we should, we should use for um, genetic targets. And we're going to, focus on our AI, but potentially these same principles would be applicable to other genetic methods as well. Um, so what, what makes a good, what are the principles we should be using for choosing genes to target with these uh, new approaches? Um, then following on from those sort of uh, the principles there, there will be a two year postdoctoral researcher who will um, uh, develop a, a, a pipeline to sort of enact those principles and find those types of genes um, based on the existing data that we have, um, and then actually take some of those into the lab and start uh, trying to apply them as RNA I sprays in, in a model system in the, in the lab. Um, and then based on that, we'll have a final working group where we kind of pull together what's being found out here and see whether that can be put together as some kind of um, uh, future funding bid based on this as a proof, proof of principle. Uh, so the working group will keep an open mind, but um, this is, these are sort of um, questions that we will pose in that. So what are the key properties for genes that make them desirable targets? Um, for example, should we target single or multiple genes? Um, if, we think, if we target multiple genes, should we do that simultaneously or sequentially? So these multi-site fungicides hit everything at the same time, but maybe if we alternated sprays between that affect different bits um, consequently um, or consecut consecutively, um, then that might prove more effective. Um, there's some questions we're interested in about how we actually detect evolution from these kind of sparse and irregular um, uh, time series and can we detect trends uh, over time? Um, we'll start thinking a bit about how evolutionary principles might align with more practical uh, aspects of, of using sprays. Um, now, I should say occasionally people claim to have developed evolution proof methods of controlling species, whether it's a new antibiotic or something else. Um, and of course, in reality, there's nothing that is evolution proof. There's always going to be selection that, and, and ways that thing, uh, organisms will find around that. So RNAi is not in itself magic, but um, it's the question of how we can develop ways of applying it that might lessen or allow us to be faster in this, in this continual boom bust, um, uh, uh, these cycles that we find ourselves in with crop pests. 
Okay, so these, I'm running out of time, but these are properties of genes that might, we could think of that might make them good targets. Of course, we don't want them to, um, to have off target effects. Um, we might um, try and look for genes that are very conserved. We might target genes that actually affect the evolutionary rate of the pathogen. So rather than trying to um, decrease its population, we try to slow down the rate that it can adapt to our other control met methods and so on. So here are a few ideas, but this will be worked out in the early stages of the project. Um, the postdoc will test things out. I think I've I kind of said this already, um, except another thing that we can do in the lab is we can actually use an experimental evolution approach to apply our sprays, but over successive generations and see if we can predict what the way that the organism would evolve resistance to that would be. Um, and this is an approach that's proven very powerful. It, it has detected resistant mutations for fungicides, but it's also used routinely with um, anti, um, antibiotics with bacteria. So all of this will go together to give us hopefully some kind of proof of principle. Um, so just to explain the team uh, in, involved in this. So uh, these are the, uh, the uh, co-applicants. So there's um, Stephen Kelly, who works in, in the biology department in Oxford. Um, so he works on uh, similar areas, but trying to boost photosynthesis among crops. So he's developed lots of bioinformatic tools for looking at uh, gene evolution, and then, and then translating that through to um, potentially engineering uh, plant gene networks to improve photosynthesis. Um, Lily Peck is the uh, PhD student who worked on the coffee wilt um, uh, project and soon hopes to um, start a, a postdoc in UCLA, um, but hopefully will be involved in the project still. Uh, Nicola Hawkins is a BBSRC Discovery Fellow at the National Institute of Agricultural Botany um, in Cambridge, and she's a leading expert on the evolution of uh, fungicide resistance and some of these lag, lab techniques for looking at fungicide resistance um, that we would hope to be able to apply in this project as well. Um, and then uh, Maudlin's very own Jennifer Castle, who sat over there, um, who works on economic forecasting models and applying them to other scenarios, including climate change, especially at the moment. But the idea is that there, um, this will be a way of trying to model and look at these kind of um, imperfect time series that we will have and, and see what we can infer about evolution over time. So it's kind of developing theoretical methods um, to go with that. Um, and then we hope to involve lots of people from other uh, universities, different research organizations. Um, and we've, the project to date has already benefited from interactions with some people in these companies, and we would hope that they will be keen uh, to continue now. Okay, so I'm just about in, uh, in time, uh, but this is the overview of the project, um, how it all fits together. And we're hoping that um, this is a way that we can try and address some of the threats um, and, and take advantage of the opportunities. And it just remains to thank uh, the funders for this work, John Fell, the um, NERC, this was supported by the department um, in Peel College here, of course, the Kaleva Centre, who are funding the, the project now that I've explained. Um, and this is to thank uh, other members of my group, um, so especially Chris Wilson, who's here, who helped at various stages with lab, um, uh, helping uh, people with suggestions for lab, like extracting their DNA and also ideas for, for the project. Um, and Ruben Knoll, who's uh, hiding at the back there behind a chair, um, who really got us started with a lot of the genome analyses that we've developed through uh, these projects. Um, Lily and Edgar, I've already uh, referred to during the talk. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm.